Roger Chartier is a professor at the Collège de France, director d'études at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales and Annenberg Visiting Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. His work in early modern European history is mainly dedicated to cultural history and the history of the book, printing and reading. He has been lecturing and publishing on the relationship between the material history of institutions and the embodied practices which both animate and survive these institutions, in particular early modern techniques of reading, disseminating, and collecting printed information. His work, based at the intersection of literary criticism, material bibliography, and socio-cultural history, is not disconnected from broader historiographical and methodological interests which deal with the relation between history and other disciplines, philosophy, sociology, and anthropology, recognized internationally, uh, Roger Chartier's hundreds of articles and books have been translated in at least 10 different languages. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me. Okay. In non-academic terms, what does all of this mean? Ah, it's difficult to ask an academic to, to speak with <laughs> academic terms. It's an oxymoron. Uh, but what I can say, you have said the right thing, that is to say, uh, if we are interested uh, as academic and uh, as a reader in the text of the past or of the present, immediately all the issues you have raised uh, appear. Uh, we read this text in a specific form. It could be a newspaper, it could be an infolio, it could be a, a livre de poche. Uh, and so we have immediately a series of differences about the materiality of the text, about the relation between the reader and the text, but mediated by the form and format of inscription of this text. And uh, we, I say we, but uh, the readers are uh, multiple, are plural, and so uh, they don't read in the same manner, for the same purpose, with the same uh, uh, intention, and with the same results. So uh, an history of reading is more an history of readers, or reading practices, and try to elucidate now and in the past uh, this different manner of reading. And so you, you mentioned my book were translated. Uh, the, the question is, it, it, it is really to read the same book when the, you read it in the language of the author or in the translation. And once the uh, issue of uh, the translation today and in the past. So it seems to me that you have not to be an academic to understand what is at, at stake here because it's everyday experience for all the reader in uh, the entire world. And so we, we can look at the different elements which constitute our experience of reading and to try, because I am an historian, I am sorry to be this, but I am an historian, to trace retrospectively the uh, uh, trajectory of the material text, the different kind of discourse, and the reading practices. Okay, so what you're saying then is that because of an intermediary, for example, a translator or a, or a printer or, or a, a type of production, first of all, that affects the way that we read the text. But second of all, you're saying that it has different meaning for each reader. So why does that matter? Yes, so first, uh, you mentioned something which is important, that is to say the authors do not write books not even their books. No. Because the, the, book, the book is a result, according to time and places, this process could be different, but is a result of a process which inscribe a text written by an author in a material vehicle. And this material vehicle, and we are thinking about the print culture, which is still uh, our culture uh, in competition with the digital world, uh, this uh, mediation are numerous. 
the copies who copy the uh, autograph manuscript. The uh, publisher who decided to uh, publish the text. The uh, copy editor, which established the copy for uh, printing. The master printer who organized the work within the printing shop. The compositor or typographer who can make some choices, and particularly more than today uh, in the 16th or 17th century. And sometimes the uh, translator, and finally the readers. So what we have to study is a chain of uh, uh, intervention or mediation which transform text, a discourse written by an author into a book, a series of uh, leaves and pages uh, within the same binding, uh, which are read by the reader. And uh, of course, uh, historically, it's difficult sometimes to reconstruct all this uh, intervention in the process of publication. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a main uh, issue. And what you say about the, the translation is an, also an illustration of this, because to read a book in a translation is to read both the author and the translator decision, choices, possibilities. And uh, I have studied uh, in uh, particular in a new book, I hope will be published uh, soon, uh, one in translation, which is a, a play with lost in translation. Yes. The yes. one in translation is to show how sometimes the translation of one word could be a decisive issue. Sometimes yes. in the context in which the book is located in its translation, very different from the context of the uh, original writing, which can transform the meaning and sometimes is the interpretation by the translator that can completely transform the status of the book. I have example for each of these uh, uh, possibilities. So we see that uh, the relationship we used to do uh, when we were at the high school or traditionally even in the contemporary media between one author and the reader and the relation be directly between the reader and the author, it's an illusion. Of course, the author yes. is present at the beginning and perhaps at the end of this process. But nevertheless, the reader encounters the author thanks to the mediation of these multiple actors or agents in the process of publication. So the big problem then is what you're saying is that the actual message that the author wants the reader to take away is being interfered with interfere, alter, the faithfully followed, it depends of each situation. Uh, we have also to remember that uh, technically, it was not the same thing to publish a book in the 16th or 17th century uh, uh, in which generally the author was not able to uh, control the process of copy editing and proofreading. To do this, you have to be uh, in the uh, printing shop. And very rarely, the author were in the printing shop. Today, of course, uh, this control in the 19th century and 20th century uh, with perhaps a new definition of who is and what is an author, their control was very strict. And we remember some authors who were always correcting and correcting before the last edition. And in this case, they tried to have the complete control of the uh, printed text, Balzac, for example, and it was a great despair for the publisher because it was costly. Yes, it cost a uh, lot of money, uh, right? <laughs> and today, uh, when the printed text is based on the files sent by the author, also we can say that there is more control. So the, there is not a invariability of this control, but of course, there is a, a network of possible relationship between complete faithfulness exactness in relation with what the author wanted and uh, a very uh, large freedom of the distance or alteration would say the author between the printed text read by the reader and what was the autograph manuscript. So would you say that your contribution to the field is bringing attention to the fact that the author's intention was not always delivered to the reader. Is that your main contribution to the field? 
this problem of the author intention has uh, two faces because we remember perhaps that during a certain time, uh, maybe it's in the 50s, 60s, in the 20th century, yeah, all the literary criticism defended the idea according to which the intentional, uh, the, the intention of the author was an intentional fallacy. Yes. And because the reader was a master of the meaning and from the uh, uh, new, criticism in America, in England, to the structuralist approach in France. There is a famous essay by Barth, the death of the author. It's not yes. because the writer was killed, but because the meaning was entirely referred yeah. to yeah. the position of reading. So this is a, a purely textual definition of the uh, betrayal or ignorance of the author's intention. What we, and I say we because the, the, the Many or uh, many historians of the book, or many literary critics uh, today, are, are the converging with the same perspective. What what is said today is different. Uh, it's not to to think that there is no authorial intention, but that authorial intention is always inscribed in a process and in material uh, object and expression, which cannot be exactly the reproduction of this authorial intention. Yeah, sometimes definitely. it's a happy collaboration, sometimes it's considered as the unpleasant betrayal. Well, the, uh, the other thing is that, I mean, if the author is still alive, we don't have a problem. If the author's dead, then it's a big argument. Of course, and uh, uh, a great majority of the uh, author today published, or still more perhaps in the early modern time, uh, uh, were dead author. In the sense uh, that the question was not their uh, intention explicitly uh, recovered, but it was the question of how people, in all the moment of the chain of this mediation we discuss, uh, appropriated, interpreted uh, the uh, meaning of the, of the text. And sometimes it was also directly linked with the materiality of the book. Uh, the author of the antiquity were dead, but also they have never seen any book which was like, uh, like the book we, we knew. We yeah. know, you know, yeah. they have written for the roles and the structure of a role, the possibility uh, of uh, users of a role is completely different from the uh, possibility uh, and structure of what we call codex, that is to say the book of today, but first during uh, I, uh, many centuries only in a manuscript form and after Gutenberg in a printed form. It doesn't matter if it's a role or a codex, if, it, if the text is the same, it doesn't matter that I'm rolling it as opposed to turning the page. That should I think you are wrong. It's not the same thing because uh, well, the text is if the text is the same, it doesn't matter how I'm turning the page or rolling the roll. I don't think so because first, uh, yeah, yeah, the roll was a, a form of book in which the same work has to be divided into several books. And so there was a discontinuity uh, in the presence of the work, which was referred to the plurality of the role. Whereas with the codex uh, as invented in the first century of the Christian era, a same book can encompass, as we know, many works, several works. And so yeah. it's a first difference of relationship with the work. Uh, when you have this uh, structure of dissemination of the world within different objects, several objects, or when you have in uh, the same book, the possibility to encompass several works and the meaning of each of them guided by the proximity with other texts and not only by this uh, uh, individual yeah. text. So I think here it's a, a first difference. The second difference is for the reading practices with the uh, uh, invention of the codex until today, you can live through a book. You can compare different passages. And you remember yeah. some painting, 16th, 15th century, show reader who has a finger into different parts of the book because they have compared one yeah. page with another page. It it's was more a, convenient. It was the first fundamental technique for the Christianity because yeah. you have always to compare Old Testament, New Testament. And you yeah. can have index, tables, concordances. So you yeah. can read thematically 
your road is impossible. You have no possibility to leaf through because you have no leaves. You have no possibility to index. And uh, more, you cannot write reading because the two hands has to be mobilized for uh, reading yeah. the role. Right. So you see there is an enormous quantity of differences. And so at a certain point, I agree, of course, you can say uh, a dialogue by Plato uh, read in the role in the antiquity in a printed edition or in a digital form as something which allows to be to say it's the same text. But immediately, if you enter into the perspective of the construction of the meaning of the text, you are confronting the materiality of its inscription, the technique possible or impossible of its uh, reading, and also the uh, plurality of the interpretation of its copy editor, commentator, and reader. I watched a brief video with Robert Darnton talking about you. Ah. And the first thing he said was that you didn't have an ounce of pomposity. <laughs> but he then went on to talk about three particular areas of uh, study that you have been outstanding in. We've touched on the interpretation of text. Can you just give me a very precise description of what you've contributed to this particular subject? It, it would be necessary to, to look at specific uh, examples because it's, not, it's an abstract and academic discourse, as you would say. Let's look at Shakespeare's okay. uh, Folio uh, 1623. Okay. 1623. Okay. okay. So, well, yes, it's a good example. As you know, I was, uh, as you mentioned, I was teaching and I am teaching at the University of Pennsylvania when we have no plague uh, in the world. And in this sense, uh, it's uh, a stronghold for the material text and also for Shakespearean studies. And what uh, I have done since uh, the first essay about Shakespeare is to show how the same text, as you said, by Shakespeare, has been uh, un between the uh, late 16th century until the late 18th century, without uh, talking uh, later, uh, transformed by several in several lives. And uh, of course, there are some spectacular lives. Uh, you mentioned the, the folio, 1623, 36 play, put together a monumental uh, book, a form of canonical work, an attribution to uh, your single uh, and uh, your majestic author, so it's a, a consecration of Shakespeare as a playwright, as an author. Thanks, but, thanks to his uh, friends, uh, the printers. They wanted to do this. Exactly, the two uh, editor, the two, uh, yes, editor and uh, uh, Emmings and Condell, who had worked with him in the uh, theatrical company, yeah. seven years after his death, wanted to construct this monumental book. But if you think about how Shakespeare was read before and after, it's not the only form. Before he was read in a very fragile quarto edition, like paperback edition, yeah. without binding, which uh, have a difficult uh, a survive in a very few number. Uh, yeah. The first edition of Hamlet, 1603, we know only two copies. And many of, and the, uh, the folio, uh, we, we, we know more than 200 copies. So yeah. it, it was a fragile object. And the consequence was to keep it, you have to bind it with other texts. And the, the first, this Shakespeare of the Quartos was a Shakespeare mixed with other playwrights, with other uh, authors, without a specific identity. And so the material aid, the binding of the quarto were a way for erasing this uh, author's majesty. Uh, and after uh, you have in the, uh, after the folio and the re-edition of the folio, 1632, uh, 1663 uh, and four and 1685, uh, you have another life, life in the uh, 18th century which seems to me connected with uh, a, transform a profound transformation of what is literature and the uh, complete works, which are multiplied in the 18th century, were also uh, the first moment of a philological criticism, a kind of coronation of the author with the writing of the life uh, of yes. Shakespeare, the attempt to connect the life 
and we don't know a lot about the life mm-hmm. and the work. And finally, another form of reading Shakespeare before and after the folio was to excerpt Shakespeare. In the Renaissance, the main uh, purpose for reading a book was to extract quotation. A commonplace book, right? Exactly. Yeah. And in this case, Shakespeare was put together in form of excerpt with many other authors, but the excerpt were uh, organized according a topical or thematic order, love, death, memory, and so on. And in this sense, it was a, a form of dissolving the identity of the author. The author was important because he has contributed to a common knowledge with other authors, and this common knowledge was uh, put together uh, in the commonplace book, either manuscript or printed. In the yes, where book, copyright wasn't a concern for you. No, example. absolutely not. And in the 18th, we can come back to this, but in the 18th century, you have just the contrary, except, but for what? For showing the singularity of Shakespeare. And yeah. the genre called the beauties of. The beauties are what Shakespeare could have written and only Shakespeare. It's no more the contribution to a common knowledge is the form of exacerbation of a singular genius. That's right. This, this whole idea of the genius. Exactly. I mean, it was a result of his friends who wanted to pay tribute to him, basically. It's his, to, to pay tribute to his genius. That's why we have that folio. Yeah, it's a complicated to, to, to know exactly what were the, the motives of uh, Emmings and Condor. Uh, as you are, you are right, to, to pay tribute to... But to make money too, I gather. For them, yes, because you remember the prologue they have written is uh, uh, said, uh, you can criticize, but first buy the book. And so they yes, try, they try to, to make money uh, from the book. But I think the yeah. publisher were making more money than the editors. But yeah. it was this, to pay homage to an old friend and uh, companion of uh, a work. Perhaps also uh, they wanted to give a text they considered exact in relation to what Shakespeare had written, because we have a lot of variants in the quarter. Yes. They, they wanted to be true to his genius. Exactly, to be true in, uh, in the literal, in the literality yeah. of the sense. But it's yeah. an exception. You remember perhaps that uh, for the playwright, there was only Ben Johnson before Shakespeare who had made himself. He was the self-editor in this sense. Uh, Folio. In Who's season. this? Uh, ben Johnson. Yes, yes, okay. The other thing that's interesting is that the playwrights didn't necessarily want their play scripts to be available because they didn't want other troops putting on their plays. Yes, you're absolutely right. And this will also be true until the uh, uh, 19th century. The folio was possible because Shakespeare was dead uh, seven yeah. years before because they, they have constructed a repertoire which was being used after the Civil War and the English Revolution, and uh, based on this uh, canonical gathering of the play, would be uh, a form for the companies to, yeah. uh, to perform it. Yeah. So what, what is your contribution here? Just to, in this perspective, because I am not a Shakespearean scholar in terms of, no. of the commentary of the entire work. It was to try in, the, in, in this essay, which is not still published, the, se- the seven lives of the Shakespearean text to follow this different uh, moment and form of uh, publication. And as you know, I, I, I believe in the, if not in the common places, but in the common work. And so it was also a way for uh, using, dialoguing uh, with the great specialist of uh, Shakespeare, in particular within this perspective, Margareta de Grazia, Peter Stalibras at the University of Pennsylvania, Zachary Lesser, who is now also professor at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and to contribute collectively within this collective of a new form of approaching Shakespeare. Okay, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but so what is new? What, what have you contributed that's new? What is new? <laughs> For example, we published with Peter Stalibas an essay about Hamlet's uh, table when he, he meets the uh, ghost uh, and uh, the ghost says, uh, remember me. You have to know this. And he used tables, says the text. 
it will be uh, okay. nothing will be wiped away from the table of my memory. What were this table? And this table we discover were a very material object present in the late 16th, 17th century called the uh, writing tables. And it, it, it was a discovery because this uh, the writing table, some uh, copies survived in England because they were gathered with uh, an almanac and they allow to write without ink, without pen, and uh, yeah, being uh, outside as Hamlet is when he is listening to his father, the ghost. And yeah. so this uh, writing table were uh, an object in, in which, because there was a, uh, a kind of glue and uh, plaster put on the surface of the leaf of paper, you can write with a stylus without a pen, without uh, ink, and you can uh, erase what you have previously written. So you can be free to write at a time in which it's very complicated to write when you need a uh, pen, knife, and uh, uh, ink, and ink on. And it was also a, a, a possibility to reuse the same uh, writing surface by uh, uh, erasing and uh, rewriting. And I, first, with Peter Stalibas about this case of the uh, writing table in England. And after in Spain, you have an equivalent uh, object called Librio de Memoria, small book for memory, which was exactly uh, the use of this. And I reread some chapter of the Don Quixote de la Mancha, in which the Librio de Memoria, this booklet of memory, is very present. And to give a it seems to me a new interpretation of these passages if you take into consideration the materiality itself of uh, an object in which you can write, erase, and write again. Very good. Okay. So we've touched on another topic here that you are outstanding in. <laughs> so we're looking at the interpretation of the text, the materiality of the book, and how those work together. And then finally, the appropriation of the printed word, especially in the process of reading. Now, can you explain that? Yeah, but Robert Danton is too generous because he has also uh, strongly contributed to uh, this history of reading. Uh, I understand why you stress this question of the uh, specific originality, but I think this kind of historical knowledge is collectively constructed. And sure. uh, yeah, of course, everyone has a specificity in terms of uh, the object, uh, the text, uh, the, uh, uh, the works he is dealing with. But for the project of an history of reading, there is a famous essay by uh, Danton, what is, an, what is an history of reading? Uh, of course, it's a collective uh, endeavor. But you have been yes. singled out to yes. me, to me as one of the giants. So I'm trying <laughs> to figure out why you're a giant. We are dwarfs on the shoulder of the giant, I said. <laughs> it was probably a connection on specific case studies between the, these different approaches I tried to, to do, in particular because I was always interested by the question of, of the translation. And as you know, I work not only with French material, but also with the Spanish authors of the Golden Age, with Shakespeare and some of the English author of the modern period, and also Italian or Portuguese uh, author. So it, it was this possibility to construct uh, objects which were crisscrossing the uh, different traditional frontiers uh, between languages and between uh, uh, literatures. And to, 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 to take an example, what I have done on uh, Don Quixote is based on this, to uh, follow uh, the uh, translation of the text, the translation and retranslation, the embodiment of the character who are going outside of the book because they appear in festivals, in uh, plays. Popular culture. Exactly. So, it was this, and I suppose Danton was thinking about this. We're also thinking about what we have done about the reading of the chapbooks. Because when you have a history of reading, what are the your sources? Generally, the sources could be what people have written about the reading. Diaries, yeah, yeah, letters, yeah. autobiographies. Plus, uh, plus marginalia that you can actually see. Uh, marginalia. But this is generally limited to the elite. 
Uh, and to the yeah. people who uh, read for writing or go write because they have read. And so if you go to the chat books, to the popular literature, uh, it's more difficult to uh, encounter any direct evidence of how people have read. So you have to be careful using the materiality of the text and the kind of reading it suggests to you and what kind of reading you can suppose with a margin of uh, uncertainty about yeah. the, the format. Because in general, all this uh, repertoire for the popular literature have nothing of popular in themselves. They were generally popular edition for text, which have circulated before in other edition. And so what you have to look at it's what are the transformation made by this publisher who are publishing the, the chat books, the ballads, in French, the Bibliothèque Bleu, and to try to reconstruct what kind of reading they expected and what were possibly the reading with a few testimonies of popular readers who have became less popular because they became later or people are entering into the written culture have said about the way to which they have read this text and so it was this question of articulating the materiality of the object with the possibility of its reading okay well as i understand it you you developed the concept of appropriation right. And it refers to the tendency of readers to draw their own meaning from mm -hmm. literary works, which don't always follow the intentions of the author. That's one of your big contributions. Yeah, but here the appropriation of two elements, first element, every reading by every reader is always singular. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. nevertheless, it would be not an object for history if we are dealing only with this idea of an absolute singularity. It's because you have some common framework yes. given by the school, given by the dominant model of reading. You mentioned yourself the commonplace technique. The commonplace technique, uh, of, of course, every reader who, uh, who have used it has done it in a singular manner. And we have commonplace manuscript, commonplace book. Yeah. But they have done this also because a general framework in the Renaissance for reading was you have to extract commonplace. A commonplace yeah. uh, meant both instantiation of phenomena, could be a, a, an event, could be a, a reality for a zoology or botany, but it could be also a universal truth. And the, more, the deeper meaning of commonplace was something which is a universal, general, permanent, truth and it's the first meaning of the word sentences sententia and so this uh, the technique was the common framework for singular experience if you are dealing with the uh, romantic reading it's the same thing every romantic reader is particular and singular but there is a form of engagement with the text based on sensitivity on feelings which are def defined a new model for the experience of reading. So appropriation has to be understood as locating the singular experience within a collective framework given by sometimes uh, teaching in the school. People learn how to read in the, in the school, but also given by a dominant intellectual model. Uh, as you know, the commonplace since the 18th century would have a completely inverted meaning. It's no more. What is very important to gather in a text is what you have to avoid in the conversation or in reading because it's very banal and right. it's very worn out. And the same thing with this uh, model of uh, a romantic mode of relationship uh, with the text. And also appropriation is an interesting word because on the one hand, it could be the idea that as we just say now, the reader are creating a meaning of the text, which is not necessarily the meaning intended by the author. So it's a form of uh, freedom, invention, creation. Almost a way of ownership, too. I can take yeah. what I think is important in that book and use it in my book. 
Exactly. You can do this. To make, to make my point that might be different. But you have to, to be careful not to make plagiarism. In you have to be careful. <laughs> I think you have to be careful for plagiarism, but you also have to be careful that you don't misrepresent. Exactly. There is a lot of uh, controversy for philosophy or literature about this question of the misrepresentation. Uh, is the commentary taking too much distance vis-à-vis -vis the authorial intention? It's always a balance between the freedom of appropriation and the respect for the uh, meaning, at least the intended meaning of the, of the text. But you know, appropriation could be also linked with property. And so it could be not the contrary, but the uh, uh, balance with what we said now, appropriation as uh, making, making something by yourself yeah. using the text. It could be also the uh, imposition of the meaning and the appropriation in this case refer to the property upon the text, discourse and meaning by the authority. And it could be the basis for the orthodoxy the basis for your censorship, the basis for prohibition. And so there is always that these two meaning in the world of appropriation to establish a property which does not allow the other to enter into your territory yes. and the appropriation to making your own of what you have received or what you have conquered. Okay, so how has this insight of yours influenced and enriched the historiography of reading? The, the history of reading has different phases. During a time, uh, as I said, there were the, uh, it was not important reading practices. And uh, in the more structuralist approach, the meaning was produced by the functioning of the language in the text. And when Bart is saying that the author is dead, because the reader is born. It's not the reader we discuss now. It's not a reader which has uh, social properties who have uh, the, the historical differences. It's a position of reading, which is at stake in this yeah. text by Bart. And so even if the readers are substituted the uh, author, what remains is the primacy of the text. After the, uh, there was in the uh, literary criticism, an effort for reconstructing the reading experience as a relation between what the text proposed and what the readers are doing. And it was the moment of the uh, uh, theory uh, of reception, the reader response theory, uh, uh, and it was an important contribution for liberating the reader from the machinery of the text. But it seems to me, and, uh, and to us, I, I suppose I can put Downton and many others in this us, uh, that it was two limits to this approach within the field of literary criticism. The first one was, of course, to consider uh, the, the work as always identical to themselves and not to pay attention to what you have started with the history of the book. The texts were abstract. They were immaterial. It was the idea. Yeah, and they don't take into consideration the multiple reasons for the variation of this text. Translation, editions, uh, the attribution, and so on. And second uh, uh, limit, the reading they suppose was more the reading of the uh, professor of literature. And so a reading which was uh, hermeneutic, uh, interpretive, where, yes, we have discovered that the uh, possibility of reading are, if not infinite, numerous. And so you have to reconstruct a kind of sociology, socio-history, to mention this also, of the readers and reading communities, which has to be constructed on the basis of uh, the differences between generation, between the place of uh, lives, between social status, between economic conditions, between uh, religious affiliation, and yeah. so on. These beliefs, inform how the text is received. Yeah, absolutely. The form of the text and uh, the uh, mental, cultural, intellectual equipment of the uh, reading communities, which is another word for uh, appropriation when it is thought of as a uh, framework. There are some common elements uh, present in all the reader of the same community. 
as a reading community. It could be the professor of the university. It could be uh, the artisan in the city. It could be the uh, pietist or uh, the mystics in religion and so on. So you have to, to make this cartography of the yes. reading communities for each moment and each place. What you're saying then is there is no one monolithic response. You're not supposed to read it in one way because that's not how it works. Your question would be why history is important. Why an historical knowledge of practices and yeah. the, the discourse of the past is important. Uh, I think it's important because this, uh, the present is layered by a series of historical legacies. And so to explore historically the, the past, it's also to contribute to an understanding of the uh, present. It's also, uh, if we are dealing with the work, to have this two uh, relation with the Shakespeare play. Of course, the Shakespeare play is present in our times, and which explain the uh, interpretation of performances. And the Shakespeare play, in this sense, is our contemporary. But the Shakespeare play was written between 1590 and uh, 1620. And in this sense, to understand its historicity, words, dramatic structure, form of publication, relation of the uh, audiences, and so on, is also in, in itself a way of contributing, perhaps, to the understanding of the play today. In, even if it is given in a form in which it's more immediately available to the uh, spectators and to the readers. So this balance between the knowledge of the past and the contemporaneity of text, which were produced in the, the Middle Ages or the early modern times, seems to me a contribution that the historian, and historian it's a, also literary critics or uh, sociologists interested by uh, history. Yeah, it's not uh, uh, the monopoly of, of a trade, of a guild. Uh, it seems to me that it's an important contribution. And uh, for me, but I hope for many people, the pleasure can be total. You have the pleasure to have the play or the text as contemporary of yourself and speaking to you because it's speaking to the issues you are dealing with, and at the same time, you have the pleasure of, pleasure of the knowledge of how in the past the uh, men and women has uh, received, interpreted, proposed, produced this cultural artifact. And it seems to me that it's not only uh, knowledge, but also pleasure we can be, that can be at, at uh, stake in this uh, endeavor. Yeah, you're, you're using one one field to inform another, literary criticism and then the study of the actual production of the book itself and the reception, you're, I guess you're getting a kind of a hybrid or a, a better picture. But it could be also have consequences on the, uh, on the production of the present. And I use production both in the literal sense of theatrical production. It, seems to, it always seems to me that the best modern performance of a text of Shakespeare, Lope de Vega, or Moliere, are not because they are uh, duplicating how it was performed in the 17th century. Just the contrary, also, because the theatrical company has this knowledge, this historical knowledge, and try to negotiate with this knowledge a form of uh, contemporaneity of the world. And if you have not this, it's arbitrariness. And many of the uh, modernization could be criticized, not because they gave a modern form to the text, but because they are not based on any knowledge of the past. And in this sense, if you take all the great uh, staging of Shakespeare play, it's always by a stage director who has this profound knowledge of the historicity of the text in order to convert it in a present uh, uh, performance, but in form by this knowledge. And when you are dealing with the uh, edition of the classical work, also, it seems to me, it's important because the best modern edition of uh, Cervantes or Shakespeare or uh, the 18th century writers are based on this knowledge, even if it was for not imposing to the reader scholarship, but to giving to the reader 
text and commentary which can make him or her conscious of both the contemporaneity of the work and the historicity of the work. Very good. There's a point in your collection of essays, The Author's Hand and the Printer's Mind, where you refer to uh, Borges and the fact that, now I'm not sure exactly how he looked upon it, but his father had an edition of Cervantes and that edition was Borges's that that was Cervantes for him and not other editions. Yes, I, I am a, a reader of Borges. I yes. think on the one hand, uh, Borges was belonging to this uh, tradition established since the golden age uh, in Spain, in which the uh, production, circulation, uh, the reading of the text become the topic of literature itself. And yeah. so in this sense, you have this uh, presence uh, in Borges' tale, uh, like you, you, here you mentioned a fragment of his uh, autobiography, but even in each of the Borges' short pieces, quite in each of them, you have as a topic this the, what we discuss in this conversation. What yeah. is the meaning of a text? How it was received? How it changed its form of publication? Now, in this case, I was interested because, in general, Borges disliked profoundly the book as an material object. He was interested, in a sense, by the, by the work and yeah. the canonical repertoire of the uh, major book of the uh, Western tradition and beyond Western tradition, he knows or something about Chinese uh, tradition. So in general, they have a complete like, uh, despise of this materiality and he, he makes fun about the bibliophile who are uh, the book, the uh, dismissurados uh, without measure. The fetishistic. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. but when he talked about uh, Don Quixote in this autobiography. There are two episodes. One episode I did not mention, but the first reading of Don Quixote by Borges was the English translation when he was young because he was in Switzerland and his father has an enormous library of yeah. English translation. And he said, when I read after Don Quixote in Spanish, I thought it was a bad translation. But <laughs> the second episode, when he read the Don Quixote in Spanish and he read it, in one of these editions published by a French publisher, the Garnier, for the Latin American market. And uh, for him, and it was your quotation, the memory of Don Quixote of his reading was absolutely inscribed within the memory of the artifact, the illustration, uh, the, uh, the binding. And for him, it was a true Don Quixote. As you said, the library of his father was uh, sold and fortunately, one of his friends found for him one copy of this edition, who was for Borges, the true Don Quixote. And I think it was symptomatic of ourselves. That is to say, on the one hand, as you suggested at a, at a certain moment in the conversation, I refute, but I agree at the same time, that uh, for us, uh, the book are the content of the book. The books are the work. The books are the soul. And we are interested by this, uh, long history of the uh, major books in the sense of the world were fundamentally are uh, helping us to understand nature, the past, history, the city, the uh, society, ourselves. But at the same time, these books we have always encountered as Borges in very specific form. Yes, it's very personal. Exactly. Their whole dimension is directly connected with the materiality of the book. No more of the soul identified to the discourse, but the body, that is to say, yeah, the binding and the specific edition in which we have read for the first time Don Quixote or Macbeth. Yeah, yeah. You talk about standing on the shoulders of giants <laughs> and you identify three giants. <sighs> Perhaps you could just briefly tell me about uh, Henri Jean Martin. What made him a giant? I mentioned Henri Jean Martin and, uh, because in 1958, uh, with Lucien Febvre, one of the founder of the uh, Annal as a journal and the Annal as a school of history, they published the coming of the book. 
1958. And it was perhaps the first uh, book uh, devoted to the book in its uh, entire dimension, and it was perhaps the founding text for the history of the book, 1958. And he was a very young at the time, was still at, uh, a student, but um, Febvre asked him to, to write, and Febvre wrote only uh, introduction, prologue of, of the text. And it was this uh, fundamental uh, uh, book. Uh, and after Martin was the French historian who identified the field of the uh, history of the book. What is interesting, uh, all, the, all the giant are their weakness. If you take now the coming of the book, it's a very curious book because the title, L'Apparition du Livre, The Coming of the Book, is very paradoxical because the book is devoted to understand the, uh, the consequences of the invention of printing. Yeah. And uh, the subtitle in the English uh, translation was The Impact of Printing. So it was devoted to the printed book and its effects, mainly commercial and as a commodity. And the last chapter devoted at the impact of the book, intellectual, cultural, or religious. But uh, curiously, Fèvre uh, sought or affirmed in all the preliminary of the book that the, with Gutenberg, you have the coming of the book and you have the first, uh, the birth of the book as if there was no book before Gutenberg. Yes, yes. A terrible, <laughs> a terrible mistake. This excellent book by Fevre Martin is based or is uh, circulating behind a completely erroneous title because, and Martin knew this because he was a student at the Ecole of, uh, who, uh, in France that prepare the archivist and the uh, librarian. And so curiously, after this uh, declaration of Fevre at the beginning, the book is a newcomer in 15th century, there is yes. a chapter about the manuscript book, which is a little paradoxical and contradictory because if the book was a newcomer, you have no book before. And after Martin was also a French scholar, interested uh, by what you, the point you mentioned, that is to say the relationship between the layout of the text and the your reading practices. And yeah. he has devoted the study about the apparition, after the, the moment in which in the book in the 17th century, the blanks appear, that is to say the paragraph, whereas in 16th century book, you have continuous printing. Yes. Or was interested by the introduction of the Roman type in the French book at the expense of the Gothic traditional uh, uh, types. So he has founded not only the history of the book, but also suggested uh, the ways for thinking about the history of reading, but an history of reading because we have no, as I said, a lot of testimony, which was also articulated with the analysis of the uh, layout, distribution of the text, inscription of the text on the, on the pages. And so uh, I think, uh, well, I don't know the, the gigantomachy uh, you are dealing with, but it was an important uh, contribution, an important author for all of us. You know, it's interesting. Now, you're French, so of course, a French author is going to influence you. I'm Canadian, and it seems to me that Marshall McLuhan was writing about this right around the same time, yeah. about the importance of the medium, about, you know, visual versus logical versus fragmented there's it, it's a lot of <laughs> yeah. a lot of stuff yeah. there that he talked about as well does he come into play with you or not so much not really but you are up to right to, to, to underline its importance and not only because he appears he appears in the Woody Allen movie and yeah. <laughs> but the the difference it's that the, the this in France, all this was born from the uh, historical approach of cultural history, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, history of the mentality first and after cultural history. And so, in the perspective by like Mike Luan, there was a historical model, but very global, very general from the, uh, the Gutenberg galaxy. But perhaps because in the French tradition, all this question and the perspective were framed within the framework of uh, an historical approach. There was more attention to the uh, specific object, the particular uh, social and economic realities than in 
McLuhan, and it perhaps the reason why he was accepted and he was uh, admired in a sense, but perhaps he was not sufficiently historical for enter directly in this pantheon of the giants of the history of the of the, of book. the book. Well, I think he was misrepresented too. Everyone was thinking yeah. about him dismissing the book when really he didn't uh, at all. And he, he stood on the, the shoulders of another Canadian, Harold Innes, the bias of communication. Yeah. Talks about the same sort of thing, but again, I guess no, he's are, not in the, in the yeah, canon. You are right. There was because there, there, there was the science of uh, communication more than the uh, historical or philological perspective. And perhaps it created this uh, misunderstanding in Europe, not only in France, but in Europe of their work. And until now, there is this difficult uh, relation between the science of uh, communication and information on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, literary criticism, uh, sociology of text, or history of the, of the book. Mm -hmm. Then you talk about uh, the New Zealander, Don uh -huh. McKenzie. Yeah, I like him. Because what was missing in this uh, third giant and the French tradition, as I said, there was no attention or no knowledge of uh, a very fundamental transformation for the history of the, of the book. That is to say, you know, the, the new bibliography as practiced in England, in the United States of America, in Canada, in New Zealand, and in Australia. And so Mackenzie was the moment in which this mode of approaching the book was introduced in European traditions, Mackenzie you formulated all this knowledge in a new manner, thanks to the concept of sociology of text. And here, of course, the historian or literary critic recognized something important because on the one hand, Mackenzie was focusing on the nonverbal element in the text, what we discussed, the layout, the punctuation, uh, the, all what connected to the material inscription of the text. Yeah. At the same time, he defined bibliography identified to a sociology of text as the analysis of production, circulation, and reading of the text. And so it was exactly the same questionnaire than what looked at by French cultural uh, history or the, by, uh, we'll perhaps discuss after, the uh, history of the written culture in an Italian manner. And so it's, uh, it was the Mackenzie, the, the bridge between tradition of the new bibliography and all this questionnaire of literary criticism when it was liberated from strictly structuralist, structuralist approach and the cultural history. And uh, Mackenzie, until now, it's a very inspiring author because in France, all this uh, discipline of erudition were generally very conservative, whereas Mackenzie was involved in the defense of the Maori people. And he made an extraordinary text in the uh, Bibliographical Society in London about the treaties, thanks to which the uh, British ex uh, established their uh, sovereignty upon the two islands of New Zealand. And it was a bibliographical demonstration of the effect of the imposition of uh, colonial domination. It was a superb essay, but it was also showing how the discipline of erudition could be at the service of the more immediate uh, and contemporary issues in another answer to you. Why do, do you do this? In this case, you do this because yes. it could be also a, a contribution to a position taken in a very important civic, political, social issue at the, at, at the time. And so Mackenzie was also fundamental, it seems to me, from this point of view. He's providing proof, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, finally, uh, the other giant, the last of the three. Yes, Armando Petrucci. Yes, <laughs> from Pisa. <laughs> he was, he was, he died uh, last year and uh, 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 unfortunately, yes, the three giants are dead. Uh, Armando Petrucci uh, is a parallel to Mackenzie because he was an archivist, he was a librarian, he was a paleographer, and he transformed all this knowledge 
into a global history of writing culture. And at the defense, perhaps, of Martin and Mackenzie, the world of Petrucci was the world of the manuscript, but not only the manuscript before Gutenberg, but the manuscript after uh, Gutenberg. And so he has a global vision, and he used the word global now. Everyone is talking about global history, but he used the word global history of the written culture which encompass the uh, manuscript uh, your text, uh, the printed book, the uh, epigraphic inscription, the graffiti, uh, all the form of the written uh, text, and which allows him to enter when you have this very broad scope of yeah. uh, definition of the written culture to deal with problems a little ignored by other traditions. For example, in, Mac in, in Petrucci, you have a fundamental distinction into power over writing and power of writing. The power over writing is a little as the second meaning of appropriation, when the power control writing, yes. the yeah. space for writing, the uh, form of writing, uh, it was a, a form of social and political control expressed through the monopoly over writing and the power of writing. And when the, the, the writing capacity is conquered by people who were marginalized in relation by the power over writing, the conquest of writing uh, and literacy by the workers, by the peasants, it could be the conquest of literacy and writing by the woman. If Mackenzie has linked the analysis of the colonial situation of New Zealand with his bibliographical knowledge, Petrucci has articulated this uh, global history of uh, writing with very deep social issues. And he, in this sense, too, he was very committed to the political age in the Italy of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it was another example of this. Uh, possible or necessary linkage between discipline of erudition and the civic commitment. Uh, because he, 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 his argument was followed until the contemporary uh, uh, time in the Italy politics and society. And so for me, it was also very, uh, very inspiring because he introduced this uh, global vision and uh, overcome a traditional frontier between the people working with uh, the book, and particularly the printed book, and people who are working with any expression, any written expression yeah. Yeah, in please. society. In this sense, you can say he was also giving the historical version of what uh, Jack Goody, the uh, British anthropologist, or Walter Hung have uh, yeah, suggested when they made the distinction between orality and the written word. But the written word, whatever it's from, may be, and not only the printed book we have discussed uh, during this conversation. So you're taking over the world. <laughs> we have yeah. discussed the general framework, but no one can do this. <laughs> we are no more in the, the time of the encyclopedist, or we are at the time of people who are working because it's a, a requisite for scientificity with very specific objects. Specific, but Every case study or text study must be encompassed within this broader perspective. It's not just a collection of curiosities, but history is not a, curious, a collection of curiosities. It's to no. work scientifically within a general framework, but on the basis of what is constituted as a precise case. Well, in fact, Darnton calls you the Diderot, the Diderot of the history of books, because of your work on the Histoire de l'Edition France. <laughs> uh, the fact that you coordinated exactly. so don't... many different cases, but yeah. I mean, there must have been a, a unifying uh, umbrella that yeah. you placed over all of these cases. Yeah, just that we, I can be proud of this Histoire de l'édition française because it was the first uh, the multi-volume series co-directed with Henri Jean Martin. So, uh, uh, yes. Uh, who has introduced both the uh, multiplication of uh, history of printing or publishing 
uh, in different parts of the world. The French uh, book was the first one. Now After there's a, sure, right? a history of the book in Britain, a history of the book uh, in the America, the uh, bilingual history of the book in Canada, uh, yep. the history of the book in Australia, and many others. And yeah. also what was interesting is the type, because in France, the initiative was a publisher who wanted to pay homage to his trade. And so it was mm -hmm. histoire de l'édition of publishing. It was good because you can have author, publisher, but, but it was histoire de l'édition. After in the uh, Anglo-American, as said the French uh, tradition, it was more histoire of the book, history of the book. So it was the first reason to, to be proud of this. But after the second reason is because once you have constructed this knowledge on the basis of uh, national history of the book, the issue is to get across because the books were not limited to no. their national identity. And so sometimes in this history, you have imported book uh, translation, but now the, the, the reflection was upon how to, to make a kind of a connected history of the book and yeah. to, to look more precisely like, uh, at the circulation, uh, at the linguistic appropriation, the translation. And so it was also a way for going beyond the first purpose of this national history of publishing or of the book. But D Danton is too generous in your quotation. There. <laughs> I can say he is a Benjamin Franklin of the, of the book. <laughs> Well, it's interesting, you know, that, that France has been a leader in the study of the book. And uh, one thing that, uh, that I was so impressed with when I was there recently yeah. was uh, IMEC. Uh, I was so thrilled to be able to go uh, to this center in Caen, just outside of Caen, and see all of these books about uh, publishers and their archives. I don't think there's anything quite like it in the rest of the world, but I wish that we would uh, follow you. You are right. And it's sad memory because the, uh, one, the first director of EMEC, Mr. Corpe, just died some uh, weeks ago. He was very ill. But it was uh, 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 during the Jack Lang Ministry of Culture. And the idea, according to which the, this history of the book, as you say, identified to a French tradition, mainly was an history from the uh, Middle Ages to the 19th century. And the IMEC was the condition of possibility and at the same time the result of the uh, consciousness that it was necessary to work with the 20th century. And yes. in this case of the 20th century, but you can create these archives. And it was the idea to ask, not only the publisher, but the author, the illustrators, the journalists, the booksellers, the booksellers yeah. every collector, to give the archive with different uh, legal status, which allows sometimes to keep the archive in the property, but to, delegate, to, to, to give to the IMEC the possibility to classify and to use the archive. And he has created a new trend. I am not working on this, but uh, I know it's very important. A new possibility to make an history of publishing, an history of the book, of the, an history of the library, an history of the book trade in the yeah. 21st uh, century. And he make was this equation. It's not completely without uh, your comparison possible. There are, after IMEC, or at the same time, at the University of Reading in England, a collection of author and publisher's papers. Yes. But less widely defined than the IMEC, but nevertheless, focusing author, publisher. Yes. Uh, recently, in Italy, was created in Milan, uh, Apice, the same purpose, to collect... There's one in Germany, too, right? After Germany, Germany was before. Because yes. in Germany, it was from the Schiller archives that yes. was developed this uh, Marbach archives, in yeah. which uh, you have archive of the author, archive of, of the publisher, and I think also archive of the book trade. So the Marbach was the first one. Well, maybe what we could just do is, first of all, I'll just throw in, are you a collector? No, unfortunately not. Yeah. Uh, you don't have yeah. you don't have the uh, the illness like I do. <laughs>
I, I think I was so excited about IMAC because that's a, it reflects my own collecting field, which is publishers' histories, booksellers' memoirs, ephemera connected to all of the publishing trade. This is what I collect. So uh, that's why I was so excited. Yeah, I imagine. But I have never... You don't have that. The, the, no, the room or the, uh, the space or the money for doing this. And so it was not... Uh, Possible. Yeah, I don't have the money either, but I still do. <laughs> but with the ephemera, it's better. It's a little cheaper than the first for you. It's not as heavy either. <laughs> okay, so final question. And that is, where do you think book history is headed? What's its future? Uh, it's an important question. I suppose we can come back to McKenzie because McKenzie you define the object of this uh, sociology of text as encompassing all the different artifacts which are vehicles for meaning beyond text, for meaning. And so at the time, it was 1985, he was already thinking about the uh, archive of the uh, digital world and what's not just the beginning, but now it's a main issue. What is possible to do it's a main issue because on the one hand, you have an obsessive question and uh, many of the, uh, uh, the conversation I have, they are always the same topic. Uh, what is the future of the book? Will the book disappear? Uh, what are the main transformation uh, imposed or proposed by uh, the digital medium uh, and so on? So you have an obsessive preoccupation and understandable. And at the same time, you have very few scholarly work because it's difficult to do it's difficult to archive the net it's difficult to analyze how the readers are reacting appropriating the digital text now, this would be uh, something which would be an issue you cannot say strictly historical it would be an issue which requires historical knowledge sociological inquiries and uh, anthropological observations. It's very difficult to construct. It's the reason why you have a proliferation of discourse about these issues, but uh, generally they are more the projection of what people imagine, fear, or desire than based on the same kind of scholarship that what we have discussed today for uh, Shakespeare, Cervantes, or the uh, 20th century publishing. And so it seems to me this would be something absolutely fundamental, very difficult to do, but was already in the mind of Mackenzie in 85, when he thinks that you have not only, uh, as your collection, not all the printed texts are books, and uh, not all the objects of the sociology of text are necessarily text. Uh, he, he, he describes the fact, for example, when you have a, a landscape, which is organized to produce a symbolic meaning. They take an example in Australia. You have a form of text, but we are not writing. You have no uh, any form of alphabetic or uh, syllabic writing. So he wanted to encompass, uh, to, to widen the your boundary of what are the legitimate or necessary object for this kind of sociology of text, knowing that all the texts are not necessary. Our definition of a text could be yeah. a symbolic construction which produce meaning. And so and go to, to, to locate our fear, anxiety, or question about the digital world could be per perhaps something which defines uh, a project. Uh, the other dimension seems to me, uh, uh, as you know now, a dominant trend in uh, uh, historical analysis is this form of uh, uh, connected histories to follow the different form of appropriation, imitation, uh, borrowing, uh, uh, movement, uh, the mobilities of uh, ideas, populations, uh, the commodities, uh, your mythologies, and to apply this to our world, that is to say, to be uh, focusing on a form of, uh, I, I gave with a, a librarian at the University of Pennsylvania, John Pollack, a, a course at the Rare Book School in Charlottesville, but we gave it in uh, Philadelphia, about this textual connected histories. And it was a way to come back to 
Martin Eiffel, the book as a commodities, but also a way to uh, focus on the different culture of the book with or without quotation mark in different uh, civilization, and also to focus on these forms of uh, translation in all the sense of the world, not only to translate the text, but to translate the meaning, to translate the knowledge. And so it could be another, another path, a new form of history, uh, what we call history of the book. But of course, uh, as I said, with the first example, it's not only history. And with the second example, it's not only the book. So the history of the book as a future, perhaps by the dismembering or the explosion of its two, uh, the two worlds uh, that defined it. Before I let you go, can you give me the most important book that Mackenzie wrote? What's the title? Yeah, he didn't, he didn't write many books. He wrote a lot of articles, but the fundamental text translated in many languages is a series of these three Panizzi lectures, British Library, 1985, Bibliography and the Sociology of Text. It was republished by Cambridge University Press with a fourth essay, that is to say the essay on the Treaty of Waitangi, this uh, New Zealander contribution. In fact, the, the true title could be Bibliography as the Sociology of Text. That is to say, he's faithful to the tradition, but he gave a completely new content of the tradition. And it was the, the target of the classical bibliographer because he, they did not accept this idea yeah. of widening the field so much. But for us, who are not bibliographers, respecting bibliography, but it was very inspiring. And so this is the, the main book. It's uh, probably it's like the McLuhan uh, Galaxy of Gutenberg, the kind of books which uh, are a moment in uh, uh, an historical uh, intellectual development. And finally, what are you working on right now? Thanks to this uh, pandemic, I have <laughs> pandemic. I have work of, since the months of March about, about the various books. Two, uh, one would be called uh, publishing and translating in the early modern period, and a lot of topic we have mentioned in our conversation uh, about about this a series of case studies of uh, publishing, but particularly of uh, translation and using the three uh, the, the different scale I mentioned. The translation, for example, of one word in the book uh, of the Renaissance, Il Cortegiano by uh, Castiglione. And here there was, he invented a neologism, which was a way for this, uh, the, the, uh, describing what is expected from a courtesan, a courtier, and it was the word sprezzatura, the form of nonchalance, negligence, and it was a very difficult word to translate by all the translators in the 16th century. So I follow Spanish, French, English, Latin, because a lot of books were translated into Latin, not yeah. from Latin, but into Latin. Oops, Castiglione, uh, Baltazar Gracia, and so it's an example. To, to follow the translation of one word in the, in the work. Or I, I have made another essay about the French and Spanish translation of Shakespeare. And I have completed another very short one about the maps within the fiction. That is to say, why there are some fiction which are used in the early modern period, maps, as now Tolkien and uh, the world of Narnia or the Game of Thrones. It's a quite a requisite to have maps. Uh, and so it's a genealogical history of the first text with maps in the sense of fiction. Yeah. Now, well, two of the books I have. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Now, have you said everything that you, you think is worth saying, or do you have anything else to finish with? Oh, perhaps we can add something because you mentioned literature. There was a profound transformation of the world and notion of literature in the 18th century. Before, if you open any dictionary, literature is erudition, paleography, numismatics, archeology. span Whereas the world for designating poetry, the novels are always fable, fiction. Yeah. When the word literature acquire the modern meaning, it's at the moment in which 
there was a profound transformation of the writing of the fiction, individualization of the uh, author, and no more or less collective and collaborative works. Or aesthetics of originality. Before, the model dominant is imitation. Of course, you have to invent, but within imitation, which is yeah. completely different from originality. And uh, which is accompanying this, it was a French author as called the consecration of the writer. It's the 18th century that the uh, people want to meet the writer, to have uh, correspondence with the author, uh, a kind of public figure of the author, where he has uh, uh, in the 16th, 17th century, nothing comparable. That's why but, biographies of writers now are so exactly. popular. Exactly. And consequence, this new definition of the literary biography, which implies that there is a relation between the life of the author and the works of the author. Yeah. Whereas in the 17th, 18th century, there are some biography, but the juxtaposed a kind of cursus honorum and a list of titles. But there is never the idea that you write on the basis of your experience. You write because you have commonplace book, because you can invent within the imitation. You write because you retake for the hundred times the same tale, the same story. So it's it, it why I use the word, uh, the author's hand, because all this was crystallized in the 18th century by the fetishization of the author's hand, the author's manuscript. And it's a moment in which started the conservation of the autograph manuscript, a market for the uh, autograph manuscript. And we have no manuscript of Shakespeare or uh, anyone, Racine, Corneille, no one. Uh, they have completely disappeared. When they were copied for the printing shop and first for the censorship, the manuscript has no value. It was uh, totally destroyed. And so you see, it seems to me that when you look at all these phenomena of the written culture, you can say both that literature, it's a very historical category, uh, which was born uh, in the 18th century and connected with all the modern concept of uh, authorship, literary property and originality. Whereas previously, it's a completely different regime of production of the fiction and the fable. And so this could be a contribution for the relation we discussed about the knowledge of historicity and of course the fact we can today use literature in a retrospective but anachronistic meaning and to consider that Shakespeare belongs to literature. It was not the case in 16th, 17th century. And so it's an example of perhaps this kind of knowledge or work could be used, like I said, for the performance of the play could be used for this articulation between the, our present and the historicity of the phenomenon. Perhaps <laughs> it's a justification for historians. Very good. Well, thank you for uh, proving that you're a giant. <laughs> it was a great pleasure to talk to you. It was a shared pleasure. Roger Chartier is professor at the Collège de France, directeur d'études at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales and Annenberg visiting professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this uh, conversation. It was a great pleasure.